because infinity is a massive number. It's not even a number. It goes on forever. You can't ever reach the end of it. So what's happening to these numbers? Are you getting bigger or smaller? This is a probability, right? If I had 10 segments, the probability of choosing one of them would be 0.1. If I had 100 segments, the probability of choosing one of them would be 0.01. If I had 1,000 segments, the probability of choosing one of them would be 0.001. Does that make sense? I have an infinite number of segments up here. An infinite number of segments. What's the probability I'm going to get exactly one of them? Is it big? Is it a, is it a good chance I'm going to get one of them? Or is this probability is 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. What's the probability I'm going to pick one item out of an infinite number of them? It's like finding a needle in an infinite haystack. Are you going to do it with one guess? Are you going to go in there, hmm, let me find this needle. Oh, I caught it. Is that going to happen? Is it? Are you going to find a needle in, a, in an infinite haystack? One needle in a stack of hay that's bigger than the earth. Can you do it with one try? Probably not. Your probability is very close to zero. Very close. To, in fact, it's zero. If you take it to infinity, it's zero. So this probability of at actually finding one time, one specific time, the probability is zero. Raise your hand if you understand that. That probability is nothing. So instead of actually looking for one time, what you have to say is, I'm going to look at a range of times. What's the probability instead of ending at exactly 50.432789 seconds or minutes, we're going to say, what's the probability that this class is going to end somewhere between 50 minutes and 50.5 minutes? You have to give a range of numbers. Because one specific one doesn't even, doesn't even calculate. You get zero every time. So we're, this number comes because we're forcing the area to be one, our width is two, our area is one. We can't find the probability of any specific given number because that's like finding a needle in a haystack bigger than the universe. It's not going to happen, all right? It's one divided by infinity. You cannot do that. It's zero. It is zero. There's no probability in that. So instead, what we do is we realize a couple things about this and then we calculate the probability of a range. First thing we're going to realize is called a density curve. A uniform distribution is a type of density curve. Density meaning like an, an area curve. Firstly, the area must equal 1. And the reason why it has to equal 1 is because we're going to associate the area with the probability. We're going to get a proportion of this area, right? Like 0.3 or 0.25 or 0.5. That's how much area we're going to have covered in here. If the whole thing equals 1, part of it is part of 1. True. If, it, if our area equals 1, we're going to associate that directly in a 1 to 1 correspondence with our probability. <coughs> Also, because we're associating this with a probability, the height of each individual value has to be less than 1, less than or equal to 1. Can you ever have a probability that's greater than 1? No. By the way, um, this is a good kind of segue, uh, segue, but a little side note. On some of your homework that I graded, and I'm, I'll, I'll pass back to you in a little bit, uh, some people gave me probabilities of 2.937 or something on one of your problems. If your calculator says 2.937 for a probability, you need to read a little bit further. It might be saying times 10 to the negative 4 or something. Did you see that on some of your problems? Because what that means is you need to move to decimal place. Don't give me 2.97. That's not the right answer. If you have 2.97 times 10 to the negative 4, it's 0.000297. Okie dokie. So know how your calculator works. Your probability will never be greater than 1, ever. <coughs> With that in mind, this probability for each individual value will be less than 1. So the height for each value must be uh, greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 1. These two conditions let our density curve or our distribution represent our probability. The fact that it's equal to 1. Probabilities are equal to 1 if you add them all up. Look what we're doing. We're adding them all up, right? Adding them all up. It's equal to 1. Also, each one has to be between 0 and 1. That's true for probabilities as well. That lets a, a graph represent probability for us. And it lets us solve this question. 
find the probability that our class will end between, let's do 51.5 minutes and 52 minutes. Okay, let's, let's go over this one more time. First, I'm going to erase the area equals 1 because, well, that, that's true. The area does equal 1. We made, it, we made it so that it did. We put that certain level there so that our area is equal to 1. Are you all with me on that one? Feel okay with that? All right. One last time. What's the probability of the class ending at exactly 51.5? What's the probability the class will end right at 51.5? Five zero 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 four eternity. What's the probability of that happening? What's the probability of any single value occurring in a probability distribution with a continuous random variable? Zero. The probability of a single value is zero. Nod your head if you're understanding that. Good deal. So what I'm asking you is not for fifty one point five, but this range. I'm asking you for what's the probability we're going to end between a couple times, between 51.5 and 52. That's something we can talk about. That's a range of numbers. That's an area. Let's see if we can calculate this area. How wide is my rectangle? I think the murmuring was 0.5. At least I hoped it was. So sound like to me. How high is our rectangle? How do you find the area of a rectangle? You can say louder than whispering. How do you find the area of a rectangle? Length times width. What's our length? Okay. What's our width? Nice. This is actually a square. Somehow it doesn't look like a square, but it's square. Our area is 0.5 times 0.5. We can all do 0.5 times 0.5. How much is that? I want you to think about what 0.25 means. 0.25 is an area, true. But because the area of the whole entire distribution equals 1, 0.25 is also a what? A percent or a probability. That's a probability. So we can answer the question, what's the probability that our class is going to end between 51.5 and 52 minutes? And you say, what's the probability? 25% probability. So this probability here is 25%. We need to get used to the idea that the area and the probability are one and the same. If you have an area equal to one, you can associate it with your probability. Raise your hand if, you, if you're understanding that concept. By the way, you could, you could have 25% for each one of these four segments. Do you guys see that? So all together, they do equal 100%, don't they? 25 for each little section. Now, this is a nice start off because it's a uniform distribution. It's very easy because it's a rectangle. We know how to find area of a rectangle. So you know how to find the area of this. Find that area. You got it? Cool. We're done with class. You all know how to do that, right? No, of course not. If you had a calculus uh, class and you knew the, the shape of this curve, you knew the function, you could do it. You could do it with what's called an integral. And you take it from negative infinity all the way up to this to that number, and you, you, you'd integrate that. But we don't have that. Fortunately for us, someone's taken a look at this distribution and already calculated all the possible probabilities for that. Isn't that kind of cool? And have a formula for that. So that, that's kind of nice. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Before we get there, though, we got one more, one more thing to talk about. And that's, that's this. Normal distributions. Wow, most of the rest of our class is going to be talk, spent talking about normal distributions. Here's what I need to tell you, though. When we talk about normal distributions, we're talking about 
geez, an infinite number of different shapes here. I want you to think about this. Now, all, all these shapes are going to look very much like a, a bell-shaped curve, all right? But we can squash those bell-shaped curves, and we can widen out those bell-shaped curves. For instance, let me, let me give you an idea about, about this. If we can compare the average height of women to the average height of men, who's taller, men or women, on average? Men. They're generally, on average, taller. So if I were to graph the heights of men and the heights of women with their normal distributions on the same like number line, say, we get this for, oh, by the way, the standard deviation, here's the, the means and the standard deviations. Women have a, an average height of 63.6 inches, standard deviation of 2.5. This is for a certain population. And men have a average height of 69 inches with a standard deviation of 2.8. The standard deviation tells you how spread apart your data is. Remember talking about that? So if I have women with a 63.6 average, and a standard deviation of 2.5, my data would look like that. If I graph the men right on top of this, men's average is what did I say, 69? That means their peak is going to be slightly over. Do you see what I'm talking about? Their standard deviation is 2.8, which means that it's going to be slightly wider spread. So this, this peak isn't going to be as high. Notice that the peak, by the way, is the number of people on that are really close to that. So the peak is not the 63.6. That's just where the mean is. The 69, that's just where the mean is. The distribution is how those data are gathered. If you took everyone in the world and plotted them on a, a graph uh, with their, their heights and, the, and tallied them up, then we'd have the most people around 69, the most, pe most women around 63.6. That's where those heights are coming from. So here, our graph would be a little bit shorter, a little bit more spread out. It'd look like this. Oh, wow, not even close. That's horrible. Let me redraw and all cool and stuff. Now, I've kind of emphasized the spread outedness, that's not even a word, uh, of this graph, but I want you to really see the picture. So the height, the height of the graph, a little bit lower, there's less people around that 69 because they're more spread out. They're a little bit more spread out than this one is. Not just if you're, if you're following these, this example here. Okay, so. Standard deviation says how close we are to the mean. This one is closer than this one is. The average themselves are different, so this graph is not exactly the same as the women's graph, even though we have two normal distributions. They're both normally distributed. We have a different shape. In fact, with every different situation, you're going to get a different shaped normal distribution. Are you with me on that one? So we're going to have tons and tons of normal distributions. And the person who kind of first thought of this said, wow, you know, if we have so many normal distributions, we really should have a way to unify them, to make them standard, standardized. Standardized means take this stuff, put it on the same scale, basically, isn't it? That's why everyone in the United States pretty much takes a standardized test in high school. Haven't you taken a standardized test before? If you were in high school, you probably did. Uh, you took this one test that everyone else takes, right, to put you on the same scale as everyone else to see how you compare to everybody else. Sometimes it's kind of depressing. It's kind of like, all right. Right? But the, the idea is it's standard, it means everyone takes it, and everyone's on the same scale now. Well, the person who said this was like, okay, well, that's a good idea. Let's take all these normal distributions and let's standardize them. 